We are currently in the book of Acts. We started last week in Acts chapter 1. Uh, we are still in Acts chapter 1. So let's uh, turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts and let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. We thank you for this time together where we can study your word. Lord, you know all the stuff going on in our lives and the people in our lives and a lot of it is great, a lot of it is hard, but Lord, we thank you that you are with us always to the end of this age. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, fill us up overflowing with your Holy Spirit, because apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, we just commit this time to you and pray that you would speak to us from your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I heard a, sto a story about this young man who went to the grocery store to buy orange juice and yogurt. And as he's going down the aisles, he sees this um, elderly woman that just kept looking at him and just staring at him. You go down the next aisle, and there she was again, just looking at him and staring at him. And he's just, she's just intently watching him. And as he got close to the, the checkout line, there she was again. And she slipped in front of him and stood there just staring at him. And finally he said, do I know you? And she said, no but you look exactly like my son and he just passed away and you know it was so sad and I really miss him and, and the young man said oh I'm so sorry to hear that so she said can I ask you to do me a favor and he said sure anything and so when I leave the store will you wave at me and say goodbye mom I, I miss that so much oh sure I could do that and so she went through the line and he had all of her groceries in her basket and she starts heading toward the door and she looked back and she, you know, waved and he shouted out, goodbye, mom. And so she went out the store and left and he turns to the clerk and she said, that'll be $240. <laughs> what? I just came in for orange juice and yogurt. Well, your mom said you were paying for it. <laughs> Ooh, I set you up. Oh, man. Okay. I should have learned from first service that was not a good joke. Oh well, glutton for punishment. So turn in your Bibles, Acts chapter 1. In our first study, we covered the first uh, eight verses. And Jesus was giving his disciples some last-minute instructions before he ascended back up into heaven. And the most important thing he told them to do is wait for the promise of my Father to come upon you. The Holy Spirit would come upon them. And he said back in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And this is already after he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's in them, but he says, Now you've got to wait until the Spirit comes upon you. And so here in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we saw that Jesus was reiterating that to the disciples. You know, wait until the Spirit comes upon you. You know, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, it was only then that they would be able to minister to the people in God's power, with His love, in instructing people the way God wanted them to be instructed, to just be the hands and feet for Jesus. Uh, again, the, the title in most of your Bible says the Acts of the Apostles, but a more accurate title would be the continuing acts of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the lives of the disciples, because as we've already noted, before Pentecost, the disciples were hiding, they were terrified, they were hiding in fear. And then after Pentecost, they become these lean, mean preaching machines. Uh, before Pentecost, they were confused, they were weak, but there's a radical change that's going to come over them, as we'll see next time, Lord willing, in chapter 2. The Holy Spirit empowered them with boldness, with zeal, uh, with strength, and above all, with the love of Christ that constrained them or motivated them to take the gospel throughout the world. Jesus had told them back in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. With, uh, he who abides in me and I am in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. 
And the disciples would prove this on many occasions that apart from Jesus, they were weak. They were going to get themselves in trouble. They did not have the ability to do what God called them to do. And I'm sure most of us in here have experienced the same thing in our own lives, that apart from the day-to-day, moment-by-moment, uh, walk with the Lord, the empowering of the Spirit, we can't do what He's called us to do. You know, we get afraid, we get timid, uh, we get withdrawn, whatever it might be, but God wants to use all of us for His glory. In our own flesh, you know, we will stumble, we will say dumb things, we'll do certain things that don't reflect Jesus. And so, we need to continually seek the Lord, continually be filled and refilled with the Spirit so that we can represent Him to those around us. The Apostle Paul uh, gave us some great scriptures to um, hold fast to, you might say. Philippians 1.21, here's Paul's outline for life. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. As long as I'm going to be alive, I'm going to live for Jesus. And then when I die, I'm going to be going home to be with the Lord. That's gain. Philippians 4.13, Acacia just quoted it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, Paul's life was very well summed up in Galatians 2.20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so what an awesome outlook on life. But again, the only way we can live that kind of life and bring glory and honor to the Lord is to walk in His power, not in our own weakness. To walk in the power of the Spirit, not according to our flesh. And so we need this filling. So we left off in chapter 1, verse 8. Let's pick up again in chapter 1, verse 8. We'll we'll start here. Um, Jesus says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And again, the Spirit was in them back in John chapter 20, verse 22. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Again, this is not only the outline for the book of Acts, this is also the key verse that we find uh, over and over again where it says the, the disciples or Paul or Peter being filled with the Spirit did these amazing things that God called them to do. Now, They would preach the gospel. They would uh, be used in amazing ways to touch people's lives who were sick, who were hurting, who were struggling. But it would be through the power of God's love that would continuously motivate them to be light and salt to the world around them. So look at verse 9. It says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So as he's sharing these final truths with them, that's the last thing he said. You'll receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses. Living martyrs is the word for witnesses there. And you'll be these witnesses of me throughout the, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. And so as he finishes saying that, they're just standing there and they watch him as he is taken up, it says, in a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, I don't believe this was just an ordinary cloud up in the sky. I think this is the, the, the very glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, just welcoming Him, just receiving Him, carrying Jesus from this earthly realm into the heavenly realm. The Bible speaks a lot about clouds. We just finished the book of Exodus, and the very last few verses there in Exodus chapter 40, they dedicate the tabernacle It's all finished, and then it says the cloud came upon, the glory of God came upon the the tabernacle. And Moses and the others, they couldn't even go in. It was just so thick, so heavy, the glory of God that filled the place. We're told over and over again in Exodus that they would only follow the cloud when the glory of God moved, then they would move with the cloud. They'd set up camp when the cloud would stop. Uh, The same thing happened when Solomon was dedicating the first temple there in Jerusalem. It says, The cloud filled the house of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so the cloud of God's Shekinah glory. Now when Jesus, uh, when he returns, he's returning in a cloud. It says in Luke chapter 21, verse 27, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. 
It says the same in Revelation 1.7. This is referring to the second coming of Christ. Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, Amen. Now, remember when Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, you know, they wake up and they see, it's like, oh man, there's Elijah, there's Moses, and there's Jesus in his glorified state. It's good for us to be here, Lord. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then all of a sudden it says, a voice came from the cloud. And it says, while Peter was running off of the mount, still speaking, you know, about doing this work, we've got to build these tabernacles, then in uh, Matthew 7, 15, it says, While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In other words, Peter, close your mouth and listen. You know, don't get all excited about this, but listen to what my Son says, because Jesus alone has, has words of life. So the cloud is something special, wonderful. When the rapture takes place, we are going to be caught up with the saints who have passed on before us in the clouds. This is what 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 tell us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I think it's more than just puffy white clouds. I think it's just the presence of the Lord because the Lord is going to be there in the clouds. We're going to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now look at verse 10. It says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. And so they're just you know, looking up. They're just watching Jesus go up and up and up and he disappears into the glory of the cloud. And these two angels, I believe, these two men in white appear and personally, I think these are the two angels that were at the tomb of Jesus. Remember when Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb and you know the stone had been rolled away? And it says in John 20, verse 12, that she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. A beautiful picture of the, what we saw in Exodus, the, you know, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat, the two cherubim on it, touching their wings. And now we see these two angels there. You know, and they're just looking at the disciples and their mouths hanging open. This is amazing. It's like, man, why are you looking up there? Why do you stand stazing, gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So this is another wonderful promise of the second coming of Christ. When he returns in power and in great glory, he's coming back visibly in a cloud. And you know, Jude 14 says, Behold, he is coming in a cloud with ten, or what it says, ten thousands of his saints. Not ten thousand, but ten thousands. It means thousands of thousands times thousands and thousands. So ten th and an innumerable number. Jesus is coming back with his saints, you and me, clothed in white. Uh, what an awesome sight that will be. Jesus comes from heaven back to earth. He's going to bring an end to the great tribulation, that seven-year period where God's re, you know, dealing with the Jewish people once again, but also putting his wrath down upon this planet against those who've rejected Christ. It's going to be a brutal time, but at the end of the great tribulation, here comes Jesus riding on a white horse, and we're going to be coming back with him riding on white horses. I don't know how to ride. Well, you'll learn in a hurry. Don't worry. It's all going to come together. But in Revelation 19, look at these verses, starting in verse 11. This brings an end to the great tribulation upon the earth. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Verse 14 says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, if you go back to verse 8 of Revelation 19, that's the bride of Christ. We're coming back with him, clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, following him on white horses. Verse 15 says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. 
He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has a name on his robe and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the very next thing that happens is the Antichrist, the false prophet who've been deceiving people on the earth, they're thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. And then Satan is bound and he's thrown into the abyss, the bottomless pit, where he will be for the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And we're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus as he establishes his kingdom upon the earth. And it's going to be glorious. And we will have the privilege of being with the Lord when he does these things. In Zechariah chapter 14, speaking of the second coming of Christ, verse 4, it says that in that day when Christ returns, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two. And we'll see there's an earthquake that will split it in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move to the, uh, toward the north and half of it toward the south. And, and so it'll form a large valley that will lead directly to the Temple Mount. You got those pictures of the Golden Gate, the East Gate. You can see this is a pic. Well, I'll go back to the first one again. So that's from the Mount of Olives. That's the Kidron Valley down below. And then you get the Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate. It's called on the top. That's the only uh, gate on that side of the Temple Mount, the east side. And so when the Bible says when Jesus puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two. It's going to form a valley. It's going to go all the way up there. And the next picture is the Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate. And Jesus is going to go through this gate. He's going to go up on the Temple Mount. He's going to establish his kingdom. There's going to be an amazing temple that the Lord will put up there after the Antichrist is kicked out and locked up. And it's not the temple the Jews want to build now. There's one coming after that, Ezekiel 40 to 45. It's a massive temple where Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. So the Muslims, because they know the Messiah is supposed to go through these gate, this gate, they sealed it up. They put cement on it. They put a graveyard in front of it. No Jews are ever going to step on a grave. And so this is their way of uh, saying, we're not going to let the Jewish Messiah in. It's not going to stop Jesus. Come on. There, there's a gate. Um, Lean Rittmeyer, I encourage you to look up L-E-E-N uh, Rittmeyer. He spent a lot of years under the Temple Mount. Uh, doing work on the Temple Mount. He did some amazing photos from underneath this where he found the original pillars of the Golden Gate you know, Temple uh, gate there. The, the amazing pictures, you can look them up. Anyway, this is what it says in Psalm 24, verse 7. King David writes, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. And that's a reference to Jesus coming back, going through that gate and establishing his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. So it's going to happen. Jesus is coming back real soon. Well, at least seven years away. And uh, that is one of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. On the other hand, there's a flip side to this question that the angels ask here in verse 11. Notice again, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? He could say the same thing for some of us here today. People of Grand Junction, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? There's a balance in all this. I love prophecy. I love talking about the rapture. In fact, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, it's mostly about the rapture. And I love talking about those things, but we don't just stand here looking up, waiting for Jesus to take us home. We also need to be looking around. And there's work to be done. Occupy until I come, Jesus says. Be about the Father's business. There's a lot of people who are dying in their sins. You know, it's a great thing that young people got to go down to Mexico. They were looking around, seeing what needs to be done. Craig and Jody going to Israel. There's a lot of work to be done. Ministering to the IDF. Ministering to those who are hurting, those who are struggling over there. And they're under constant bombardment. You've got to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. A lot of things to be done. Don't just you know sit on a mountaintop looking up, waiting for Jesus. You know, you know, Steve Dine on our Tuesday morning men's Bible study, we're going through Ezekiel, 
And you know, he's a great example because he loves prophecy, he loves to talk about the rapture and what's going on in the world around us. But he goes to the gym all the time. At least he tells us he's going to the gym. Uh, <laughs> and, but he's always got guys coming up talking about the Lord, talking about what's going on today. So you want to look up, but you're also looking around for opportunities to share the love of Christ, the truth of God's Word with those around us. We need to have love and compassion for those who are dying without Jesus. He alone offers salvation to those who are in need. And so, ask the Lord to give you a burden for the lost. Ask how you might be used by the Lord, how you might pray for those around you, how He might give you opportunities to share the gospel with them. Here's a great few verses here. Matthew 9, 36 says, But when he, speaking of Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Again, while we're looking up, keep looking around. Let's not forget to keep looking at those who need Jesus. See who the Lord might bring into your life that we can minister to them. Even if the elderly lady at the grocery store keeps staring at you, you don't need to pay for a gro- Well, if the Lord puts it on your heart, pay for groceries. But let her know about Jesus. Look at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And so Mount, Mount of Olives, on the east side of the Mount of Olives is the little town of Bethany. That's where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived there. That's where Jesus ascended. And so they just go up to the top of Mount of Olives and back to Jerusalem. They would have gone through that eastern golden gate to get back on the, you know, into the city there on the Temple Mount. And they'll spend time up there and so forth. But it says here, And when they had entered, so they're going to this upper room, as we'll see later. Well, right now, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There was an old joke, I remember years ago, they all continued with one accord in prayer. So you got 11 disciples in a Honda Accord? I don't think that's going to work. No, that's not what he's talking about. I was a new believer, and it's like, I don't know, I don't get it, Lord. Sorry. They all continued in harmony. It is, you know, in prayer, supplication. Somebody just got it with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. And so, what do they do first? Jesus is gone. We're waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do now? Let's pray. That's always a good thing. You don't know what to do. You better enter into prayer. Wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 31, But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint. Now, he's just commissioned them with this monumental task of taking the gospel throughout the known world into a hostile environment. And so they had better stop and pray and wait for the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Notice it says that women were also in this prayer meeting. There's 120 people gathered together in this big upper room. You know, the room would have been close to the size of this auditorium here. And so you got 120 people there gathered together with these women. That would be Mary Magdalene, Salome, uh, Joanna. And it mentions Mary, the mother of Jesus. Something important to note here is she's praying with the other disciples. Nobody is praying to her. Nobody's praying to her. And that's important because, unfortunately, some groups have elevated Mary to this place of prominence and preeminence where they put her equal with Jesus. In fact, there is a a big cross over in Rome where it has Jesus on one side of the cross and Mary's on the other side. That is just wrong by 
any stretch of the imagination, that is just wrong. Some people have said she's a co-redeemer with Christ. Um, it's just a very sad situation. Here's Mary with the apostles and these other women, and it mentions Jesus' brothers. Now, who is that? Well, we know their names, James and Joseph and Jude, and I just spaced out the other guy's name. Uh, Simon says, Matthew 13, 55, it mentions that Joseph and Mary had four sons after Jesus and at least two daughters, because it mentions daughters. So the, the proper order is Mary, as a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit, brought forth Jesus. And then Joseph and Mary had at least six children together. So don't think that, oh, she's a perpetual virgin. Oh, she's at the right hand of the Father. That's all not true. She was very, very blessed. Our perspective should be she was truly highly favored, blessed among women. That's what the angel Gabriel said. But when she's acknowledging what God is going to do in her life, this is what she says in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Who needs a Savior? Only sinners. If you're sinless, then you don't need a Savior. But she acknowledges, I'm a sinner. She knew she was not perfect. She knew she was highly favored. She was tremendously blessed. But don't put her in a place that the Bible does not put her. Anyway, this is the last mention of Mary in the Scriptures. Verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with and obtained a part in this ministry. And so, speaks of Judas Iscariot. Now, again, he tells the disciples, in chapter 20, verse 22 of John's Gospel, it says he breathed on them before the ascension, and the Spirit came in them. And so here now Peter stands up, and he's quoting Scripture. He, the Holy Spirit is bringing to remembrance things that the Lord had already spoken, things from the Old Testament, things concerning Judas Iscariot here, because he's mentioned not by name, but in prophecy in the Old Testament. And so this is a great example of the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God, because it says after Jesus breathed on them, in Luke 24 it says their minds were opened up to understand the Scriptures. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He brings to remembrance things that the Lord is showing us. He tells us and, and reminds us of God's Word. You, you might be in a situation where you're not sure what's going on, you know, how to answer this person, and all of a sudden a verse will pop into your mind, and you share it, and it's like, oh, that's exactly what that person needed to hear. Well, that's not you coming up with something. That's the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind what He's planted in your heart because you're in the Word. You're spending time in God's Word. I can't remember who it was years ago said, this is like ammunition. The more you get the Word of God in you, it's the ammunition that the Holy Spirit will use not only to come against the enemy's lies, but also to speak the truth and love to those who need to hear the truth about Jesus and, and what they're dealing with and so forth. So anyway, in Psalm 41, 9, this is what Peter's referring to here. It says about Judas Iscariot, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And so that's what he's referring to. Now, speaking about Judas Iscariot, I can't think of any more of, of a tragic life than him. I mean, he walked with Jesus he, he was ministering with the other 11 apostles for three and a half years with Jesus. He was anointed by Jesus to go out and cast demons out of people, to proclaim the good news of Jesus, to heal the sick. And yet, he was never saved. Just because you see somebody on TBN that claims to do signs and wonders, it doesn't mean they're saved. You know, there's a lot of lying spirits out there. There's a lot of false doctrine out there. You've got to be very careful. Jesus said it would have been better for him never to have been born because he was, had a reprobate mind. He was in it for himself. 
he sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He was trying to become the treasurer over Jesus' group. And then when he saw that Jesus is going to be, you know, going to the cross and he's starting to buy into what Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to be raised the third day. And he's like, wait a minute. I want you to establish the kingdom of God now. I want to be the treasurer. I want to be because he was in charge of the money purse. He wanted the power, the position. And so he sells them out for 30 pieces of silver. I'll identify the Messiah in the garden with a kiss. How sad, how tragic. He was used in mighty ways, but he was not saved. Never forget Matthew 7, 21 to 23. That's where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There'll be many in that day who said, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Perform many wonders in your name? Didn't we do all these amazing things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You don't want to hear him say that. That'd be the last thing you want to hear him say. And so there should be no amount of money or fame or power or position in this life that gets in the way of Jesus. There should be no relationship that you get involved with. If they try to lead you astray from your walk with Jesus, then you need to get out of that relationship. It's not worth it to be in any kind of a compromising situation where they're trying to take you away from that close walk with the Lord. Jesus is my everything. He has done everything for me. I mean, how could I ever think about denying Him for some temporary thing that's going to be turned to dust. It's going to burn up in the end. Don't ever surrender your life to anything or anyone but Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18. It says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. Oh, I love this part. And falling, <laughs> I'm just, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his entrails gushed out. Isn't that amazing? got to read that again. No. (laughs) People are like, it's almost lunchtime. Please don't. No, after Judas betrayed Jesus and he knew he was going to be crucified, he felt so guilty for taking the money, betraying him. He goes back to the Pharisees. He throws the 30 pieces of silver down at their feet and he goes off and in Matthew's gospel says he went out and hung himself. Here it says that he um, went headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his guts gushed out. Is that better than entrails? I don't know. Some people try to use this to say, oh, there's a contradiction in the Scriptures. Matthew says he went out and hung himself. Here it says he just fell and burst open. Which one is it? Well, it's both. If you've been in that part of, you know, around the Temple Mount there, there's a lot of cliffs, there's a lot of trees that hang over the cliffs. Probably he hung himself, either the branch broke or the rope broke, and then he fell and popped open. I love that verse. Do we have a slide? No. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Anyway, no discrepancy there whatsoever. Verse 19, And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're, Peter's saying these are the requirements of the next apostle, they, they had to be with us. They had to watch the ascension of Jesus. And so, you know, there's 12 foundation stones in the city of New Jerusalem. There's 12 names of each of the apostles under those stones. The question is always, well, who is it? Well, verse 23 says, And they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice. You know, pick a name, dude. You know, three names, that's confusing. Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice. Do you ever have a mom like that? You got a bunch of kids in the family, and I've heard, even my mom did that. You know, it's like, George, Jerry, no, Jeff. It's like, those are my cousins. Yes, I'm Jeff. I mean, pick a name, Joseph called Barsabbas, whose surname was Joseph, and Matthias. 
And they prayed and said, You, Lord, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they cast lots. It's like tossing dice. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So it's kind of funny. It's like, Lord, we've picked these two guys. Which of these two do you want? I can imagine God saying, I didn't pick either one of them. <laughs> you know, and we often do that. Lord, I want to do this or that. What do you think I should do? And he goes, I, I don't want you doing either one of those, Jeff. And Okay, I'll do this one. I like this one better. And then you do it, and then it kind of falls flat on its face. And the Lord's like, I'm patient. So I'll wait for you to start listening. You know, do what I got for you to do. And so we end up picking the one we like best. And then we tell people, look what God told me to do. Look where God told me to move. Look what God told me to buy. And then six months later, I don't know why I ever did that. Because you put God in a box. Remember when God told Gideon to get ready to fight the Midianites? Gideon's like, okay, I got 32,000 men that are going to fight the 135,000 Midianites. God's like, no, it's too many. Okay, I've got it down to 10,000 to fight the 135,000 Midianites. No, it's still too many. Well, what do I do? Well, go down to the stream those they call it Gideon's uh, spring there, and there'll be 300 guys, and this is how they're drinking the water. Pick those guys. Really? 300 against 135,000? Yeah, that's what God said. So they defeat the Midianites. Amazing. So, you know, I thank the Lord that He has chosen men and women in our fellowship here who serve the Lord in so many different ways, some in front of people, some behind the scenes. Um, it makes it a true joy to, to serve here, knowing that God is picking people, and He still continues to pick people. He raises people up to serve in various capacities. He's opening doors for all of us to serve the Lord, whether it's in the church here or outside the church. There's a lot more people outside than inside, so don't get closed-minded and say, oh, I want a title, I want a position. Be careful. You want to do what God's called you to do. But notice how they cast lots. Again, this is the Old Testament way of determining God's will. This was not the way when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so in Proverbs 16.33, Old Testament, it says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. We get a great illustration of this in the, the book of Jonah. Remember when Jonah you know, is told by the Lord, go to Nineveh. And he goes, I don't want to go there. They're mean. They're nasty people. No, go to Nineveh. Tell them the judgment's coming in 40 days. They need to repent. I'm not going to do it, Lord. Please go to Nineveh. And so, no. And so he gets on a boat. He goes the opposite direction. And a storm hits because God sent the storm. And then it says the captain, and these are all unbelievers. They start casting lots, trying to determine why are we having this violent storm against us? And it says, the lot fell to Jonah. So Jonah's like, I'm busted. It's me. Throw me overboard, and then the storm will stop. They're like, okay. Storm stopped. God sends the great fish, swallows him up, barfs him up on the beach, and he goes to Nineveh. He preaches, you know, judgment is coming. And they all get saved. And then Jonah whines and complains about it. But now we have the Holy Spirit within us. Now we have the Holy Spirit upon us. And we can pray and we can seek the will of God. And, you know, God can open up doors and no one can shut. He shuts doors, no one can open. He will give us through the Holy Spirit, as we talked about last week on Wednesday night, He gives us wisdom, He gives us discernment, He gives us a word of knowledge. He will lead us and direct us the way He wants us to go. Personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I think God ignored Peter in his decision. And it's almost like God could say, and I'm not putting words in his mouth, but if I was God, I would say, okay, Peter, you can come up with your committee, your five-year plan. You can toss the dice. Okay, you got Matthias. Great. Do you ever hear of Matthias? No. This is the last mention of Matthias in the Bible. I'm sure he's a great godly man. I'm sure God did use him. But God's like, I got another choice. His name is Saul of Tarsus. And in a few years from now, I'm going to pick him, and he's going to become the apostle. Apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. He writes half the New Testament. He takes the gospel, as we're told in chapter 1, verse 8, 
to the ends of the earth, the known world at that time of the Roman Empire. So that's my personal opinion. But, you know, God didn't get mad at Peter. He didn't get mad at me when I made a stupid decision. You know, God is patient. He waits for us to come back to that place where it's like, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? Maybe he's done that with you. Just realize if you made choices and they were the wrong choice, I think we've all done that. Let it go through your memory brain. Oh, yeah, that was a dumb choice, wasn't it, Lord? He can restore what the enemy is trying to destroy. He can take it back and he can rewind it back to where, okay, I made a bad choice here. I see you what I did wrong. I repent, Lord. I confess it to you. And then you start fresh. You start new. You don't dwell in the past because all of us have a past, but now you go forward with the Lord. And the Holy Spirit will give you peace. And he says the Spirit of God will give us that peace that surpasses all understanding. That peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit's like an umpire in our lives. You start to do something wrong, he's like, no, 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 you're out. You do what he's called you to do, and it's like, yeah, you're safe. You know, go this direction. And, and we can learn to listen to that still small voice as we spend time in the Word, and the Holy Spirit will bring the Word to life within us. Amen? Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I still want to see the video of the Judas falling and entrails blowing out. I mean, what a scene that must have been. I'm just kidding. Don't write me any letters saying you're just... Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises you've given us. We thank you, Lord, that you are coming back. At the rapture, you're coming for your bride, and we will be caught up into your presence. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet you, Lord, in the air. And that's what it's all about, meeting you, being united with you forever and ever as the bride of Christ. And Lord, then you're coming back, and you're going to establish your kingdom on earth and we can't wait it's it's hard to imagine how glorious this planet that's being devastated even now with the wars around us with just all the drugs all the you know alcoholism you know we see these cities just falling apart and lord we wonder how much longer but lord while we're waiting and watching and, and while we're being ready lord for your uh, coming for your bride, help us, Lord, to also look around and see those who are hurting, those who are struggling, those who are desperate, those who need the love of Jesus. They need the forgiveness that only Christ can provide. Lord, give us opportunities throughout this coming week to look around and see the people that you bring into our lives. And then we pray that you give us boldness Empower us with your Holy Spirit so that we don't shrink back, but we speak the truth in love to those you bring into our lives. Lord, we know it starts in our families. It starts in our neighborhood. That's our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Lord, we just pray that you would go before us, open doors that no one can shut, and shut doors that no one can open, and give us your wisdom and your discernment, and above all, your agape love for those around us to speak the truth of your death, your burial, and your resurrection. You paid the price in full for all of our sins. May we never be ashamed of that gospel message that you died for us. You paid the price in full. Lord, you were buried in that tomb, but you conquered the grave, and here you are in our midst, offering the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will humble themselves and say, Lord, I need you, Jesus. Lord, I need your forgiveness. Lord, I, I need your blood to wash me clean. And so I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that I can live a life that brings glory and honor to you. And if you pray that prayer, simple, by, simple prayer by faith, God will honor that. You're not looking for you to jump through hoops and put on a certain kind of outfit suit and tie. He doesn't care about those things. He's looking at the heart. 
And he just wants you to surrender your heart to him because he loves you. And Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that Jesus is with us always, even to the end of this age. And so, Lord, we just commit our hearts to you once again. And thank you for using us for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's uh, worship the Lord. And as always, if you need prayer, please come on down. We'd love to pray with you and hopefully encourage you in Christ.